Good to Prithvi Dhirwani, Chairperson Kaching 2021, and Ms. Anunita Jana, President Ichcon. Mr. Pavel Chakraborty is an Assistant Professor of Economics at Lancaster University, and his research specializes in firm-level outcomes such as product choice and innovation, among many others. Thank you so much for joining us today, sir. How are you? My pleasure. I'm, I'm pretty well. Pretty well. Not bad. Lovely. Um, so let's just get into it, shall we? Um, so sure. before we dive into the questions, Mr. Pavel mm -hmm. has some uh, a slide to show to all of us um, about the topic we are going to be talking about. So, sir, please take the stage. Yes. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm re really glad to be here with you guys. Uh, the, let me start sharing my s slides, and then I can start uh, saying what I am doing. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. So what I will be talking about first is how a patent reform can actually induce inequality. And this is based on a paper, joint paper with uh, two of my co-authors who both are in, I am Sarabh Bhattacharya is in I am Calcutta and uh, Chiranthi Chatterjee is I am Ahmedabad. So this is a joint paper we are working on for the last couple of uh, one year or so. Um, and some of the results and the ideas I thought could be uh, applicable or very relevant to the topic of IPR and inequality, because there's not much been uh, focus uh, on IPR and inequality. There's a vast amount of research from 1990s onwards when the IPR reform started actually in the developing countries, mostly starting with Asia uh, because the countries were joining WTO, they are undertaking trade reforms and when you, are, when you are undertaking trade reforms, you have to write or sign these various agreements of the World Trade Organization and TRIPS is one part of that agreement, which is called the Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights. And when you write that, you have to kind of bind with the agreements what TRIPS says or the WTO says. And there's been a lot of research from 1990s onwards about how innovation affect, uh, sorry, how patent regime affect innovation. And you will find like cross-country study, different countries, you'll con find country-level studies. There's lots of studies on India that how IPR change has affected technological licensing, R&D, patents, and everyone. There are a couple of papers during this literature, but everyone was talking about the aggregate effect, the effect of IPR on national level, cost country level, firm level, but at an aggregate level. There are two papers that came out in 2005 and particularly in 2006. They argued things a bit differently. Both argued in terms of innovation, though, but they argued things a bit differently. They argued that in our world, there are two kinds of firms. One is technological leaders and one is technological laggards. Some That means basically some are high technology firms and some are low technology firms. And why do I define high technology and low technology? That basically before the reform, which firms are valuing the innovation more are kind of technological leaders in the in that industry or in the manufacturing industry or services industry and who were not valuing innovation or technology that much are kind of the technological laggards. Now, whenever you have an up regime change or a regulation like this, that you are giving stronger incentives to innovation, what you are giving actually, you are actually giving similar intense incentives to all the firms, right? Government is not coming out and saying this firms will do more innovation and this firms will do less innovation. It's not like that. They are giving stronger rights to innovation to everyone who is innovating. Right? That's the policy that I'm giving stronger rights to innovation. You come up with a product and I, I'll patent your product. And these would be 20 years, whatever it is. Now, they are arguing that the firms which are valuing the innovation more or the technological leaders would be differentially affected because they are already into innovation. They are already investing in technology. And that might create an inequality over time. Because they're affecting differentially, because of the reform, 
they might that inequality between these firms might increase we actually see inequality increasing not decreasing even though if you think of the policy the policy is not inequality decreasing policy the policy is actually giving equal benefits or rights to everyone who is innovating but by the definition if you consider the definition in the pre reform when the reform hasn't happened or if you classify the firms into different groups we'll actually see an unequal outcome rather than an equal outcome but both of them one was a theoretical paper and when i say theoretical paper in economics we mean by mathematical models the first one showed in by mathematical models that actually are inequality is creating over time and the other one if you see the empirical which one is basically they showed also but they showed in terms of technological licensing that when ipr reform happens the technological leaders kind of do much more technological licensing or technology transfer from other from north to south countries or developed to developing countries rather than the technological leaders this was what the scenario more or less in the innovation ipr literature recently there were two papers that actually showed us there could be income inequality in there's one paper which is you can see by agion et al in 2000 very recent paper they showed us that in the us states so us is also a federal country as you know it it's divided in states like us and states vary across different laws different types of institutions and they showed us that the about 7 to 8% of the inequality between states is driven by innovation the income of the states the income inequality between the states is driven by the number of patents they filed because as you know when you file patents there are significant returns to the patents there are returns to the ones who are filing for the patents there are returns to the firms from which their patents are being filing and they get added to their wages right you and a lot it's not only the innovator gets the return it's the firm gets the return it's a lot of people who are associated with um, the patent gets the return so an income inequality can actually happen at the regional level that and this gives all, us the idea that if we really look out look up at the firm level if we go down at the firm level because ultimately it's the firms that is doing the innovation right it's the firms when you are working in a firm you, the, you innovate for a firm ultimately you hold the patent but actually firm is filing for you the patent so when we what we do is we look go out and look at at the firm level and see whether this change in the ipr that happened in india i'll come to the uh, policy change right up that actually affected wage inequality in india or not right this is and this was the first paper to look at actually change in patent regimes because the problem in developed countries to look at because the developed countries never change the patent regime like that their patent regime changes completely in a different manner that happened but our patent regime happened in a very nice fashion which we can utilize as an academician we can utilize as a policy experiment to establish a causal relationship between a patent regime change and wage inequality just give me a second so basically what we are trying to say is does higher incentives to innovations actually lead to a change in the re relative demand for managers why managers let me come just hang in for a second why we are looking at managers relative demand for managers and what we are doing we are also dividing the firms by technology so we are actually what we are trying to do we are trying to estimate a relative effect or unequal effect so we are trying to see whether the managers who are in the high tech firms are having much more earning much more compensation much more wages rather than the managers who are in the low tech firms so that gives you an idea of wage inequality that one type of workers is gaining more than the other type of workers when we have stronger incentives to innovation right uh and what is the why should the managers earn more why should they earn more rather than the non managers that's theoretical idea right why should the the first question why should the managers earn more everybody why shouldn't they earn more but if you just take a step back and think that what does actually a firm do a firm what we think of is a actually a knowledge based hierarchy if you think of a firm 
the top management actually solves for the toughest of the problems. When there is a crisis, when there is a strategy decision, they are solving the problems. And the, the solving the complexity of the problems actually goes down less and less complex when you go to the production workers. What the production workers are doing? They are going to the manufacturing plants, the assemblies are running, they are put, they're starting the machines, the products are being produced on a daily basis. Any new problem comes up in the production, think of a plant, when a new problem comes up, what happens? The production worker goes to the manager. The manager comes and solves the problem. So a, ma a firm is actually a knowledge-based hierarchy and managers solve problems in a firm. They provide knowledge to a firm. That's why the man they are managers, they have specialized skills. That's why we earn the degrees for the specialized skills. And the managers solve this, we call it less common or non-routine problems. The routine problems, which is are in, let's say there is a problem fault in the uh, in the machine in a manufacturing plant, they would ask the uh, worker to come in and they would a technician to come in to solve. The manager wouldn't go into that. The manager may have oversee, but that, that's not the problem for the manager to solve. Anything which is new, which is less common is solved by the manager. So an innovation, when you are doing innovation, what you are, you are creating new products, right? You have to file for patents. You have to create new product varieties. So that's why the managers solve less common problems, whereas the production workers or the non-managers solve the common problems. So since innovation gives you a lot of routine problems, I'm sorry, non-routine problems, you have to do some technology, you have to do R&D, and you have to come up with new products. And these are new problems to a firm. So the managers, by theoretically, the managers should be differentially affected than the non-managers, right? And this is a very brief about what patent regime in India had. So patent before India, the new patent regime happened, India had this patent amendment act called the 1970 patent act. The main fun highlight of this act was in, the, in India, you couldn't file product patents except for a few products in agrochemicals and pharmaceuticals, except for those you couldn't file product patents in Indian patent system office. For any product patent, it's not that you cannot file. You can file to the USPTO patent office. You could go to file to the UPTO. You can go to the Japan PTO can file. But in India, you couldn't file any product patents. We only had process patents. Then we ran, if you all know, I guess you know by the, in, in 1991, India ran into this big BOP problem, crisis problem. India happened and India had to go to the IMF for stabilization packages. And what happened was um, India has to sign the WTO agreement. India has to uh, go to TRIPS and said we will be establishing TRIPS. And being a developing country, the WTO gave every developing country uh, 10 years and less developed country 20 years to establish the TRIPS agreement. So 1995, India signed. 2005, India has to agree to the WTO that they have ratified all their previous law by 2005 so that they comply with the trips and India started with a patent ordinance in 1994 and that failed in India because there is a if you do if you don't know in 1994 1995 India had coalition governments during that time for 1994 and then what happened for every bill to pass on you need to debate it in lower parliament and upper parliament and they couldn't debate it out because it's a coalition government putting together a different form, different regional parties and they couldn't debate it out. So that couldn't pass on to change the laws. Then India was taken to the WTO by the US and the EU, but because you have signed the laws and you are not um, ratifying the laws, then India kind of came in 1999 when the NDA one government came up in 1999 under the leadership of Atal Bihari Bajpayeeji. Then India passed on the first a patents amendment act but the problem with the act was india though passed that act they argued that the product patents you can file for product patents now but the product patents will be only been reviewed when after 2005 you can give a priority date let's say i am filing in 1999 with a priority date as i am filing it on let's say first of july 1999 let's say anonima is filing in second july 1999 
Then when they'll be reviewed in uh, 2005, what will happen? They will look at the dates. Oh, the first Pavel has filed. So we'll review the Pavel's application first. So that's it was the order. But that is kind of uncertain, right? I don't know what will happen in 2005. That didn't actually encourage much of technology adoption. I'll show, with, show you some, with some graphs. In 2002, again, India file changed every laws that is possible with the TRIPS laws. And by the, uh, if I quote the controller general of patents and designs and trademarks, uh, they said that the 2002 Act actually replaced all the rules of the 1970 Act. And they kind of, firstly, domestically, instituted all the laws that could be ratified in order to comply with the TRIPS WTO agreement. So we utilized this 2002 because by 2005, when India was actually going to the WTO and saying that we have ratified, they have already ratified by 2002. 2005 was an extension of the 2000. So, so we used the first one, 2002, and see whether the 2002 change. So they changed the patent rights. Uh, they implemented product patents to all fields of technology. They increased the term of the patents and they also limited the government to pay, play a role. So basically the market forces could play much more role than the government forces. So it's much more market driven now. And you have to also understand the political scenario in 2002 because in 2002, the NDA one was in power and the opposition was Congress. But when the act was signed in 1994, Congress was the main party when it was signed. Um, uh, our previous president, Pranab Mukherjee, was the finance minister then, and he actually went and signed the um, agreement. And th they couldn't oppose much because under their leadership, the, the agreement was actually signed. So it was passed by the lower and the upper um, parliaments, and it was implemented. So you can see, this is what I'm plotting. I'm plotting the technology expenditure of firms. And this is basically the R&D expenditure and the expenditure of by technology transfer. Basically, uh, when you do this give out royalty payment for technical know-how, we call it technological transfer. So I sum both this and I just simple take an average across firms. And these are all manufacturing firms. Okay. Between 1990 and 2006, so you can see between 1990 and 2006, it was going up, coming down. But after 2002, so around 2002, an average firm, manufacturing firm was, let's say, investing about 8 million. In 2006, it went up to 25 million, three times in four years. It's a huge change in technology expenditure, huge change. Now, the question comes, is it an aggregate change or all types of firms are doing this change? Is it that so? And if you see, if I now what I do, I divide this between technological leaders and technological laggards. I call it the high tech. So the red line is the high tech or the technological leaders and the low techs are the technological laggards or the the blue line. So you can see both are growing till 2002, almost at the same level, although high techs obviously will be doing more technology adoption than the low techs, but both are growing. In after 2002, you see there's a difference, significant difference between the low techs and the high tech firms in terms of technological adoption. So the previous figure, it gives you the idea that the previous figure increase in technological adoption is actually been done by the high tech firms, not the low tech firms. So that gives you an idea of inequality, right? So you can see there is an unequal adoption of technology happening. Now, if I translate this, the same firms, if I compare the compensation, the share of the compensation for the managers, for the same kind of firms, what happens? You can see both are growing. Band 2002, there is a difference. Managerial compensation, the share of managerial compensation in total compensation in the high tech firms are growing significantly higher than the low tech firms. So this gives you an idea that there could be a possibility of technological adoption driving in differently the managerial compensation of the firms. And that gives an idea of your wage inequality because that gets translated. This wage inequality would get translated into income inequality. 
right? That will get translated into regional inequality. It might be the firms located in, the, let's say, Mumbai are doing all the innovation. So the managers who's located in, let's say, Mumbai or Maharashtra having earning the more wage. So that could increase the income of the state and that could create an unequal division between the Mumbai, Delhi and other states as well. So these translates into, and I just want to show, I don't know how much, two minutes more, Nurima. Uh, just to me, I just want to show one more graph. That's an interesting graph that I've. I'm not so showing any. We're having a lot of, we're learning a lot. So take your time. So this is the one I want to show you. This is what I do is here. I'm not showing you any equation. I, uh, though as an economic student, I should have shown you guys some equations, but I'm not uh, showing you. I'm just showing you graphs. Some. So this is an interesting graph. I would really want to show what I do here is. I really want to see what kind of firms are actually driving this change in the compensation. Who are driving this technology adoption? Where the wage inequality is coming from? Is it because when, you, when I'm saying there's a relative change in the, um, in the differences between high techs and the low techs, there are many possibilities, right? It could be that the high tech firms have increasing their managerial compensation by 20%. The low techs are increasing their managerial compensation by 5%. That's why there's an increasing in inequality. It could be possible, right? Both are increasing, but high techs are increasing much more than the low techs. It could be that the uh, low techs aren't increasing at all or the high techs are increasing. So what I do, I divide the firms into small deciles. So deciles means I'm dividing the firms which are in terms of technological adoption are at the bottom decile 0 to 10 percent then 11 to 20 then 21 to 30 so below 50 is the for all the firms which are below the median of the technological adoption and above 50 is the firms which are above the median technological adoption right so and i what i do i i run the regressions and i at every level and i what i do i take the coefficients of every decile and I plot them and what you see, it's very interesting that you see below 50, there is actually no effect. It's flat. Like change in compensation is not significant, does not change because of the reform. Firms below the, below the median are not valuing their managerial compensation, value their managers or not undertaking any sort of technological adoption. They're not taking at all. This just flat. You can see it suddenly goes up after the uh, median and it goes up till the eighth decile. Now you can see the top firms, which are in the ninth decile, which belong to the top percentile of the firms, like 90th to 100 decile, the effect is again zero. Why? Because these firms are, let me start in a backward calculation. Why the effect on the top firms are zero? Because these are, if you think back, these are actually multinational firms. The multinationals doesn't care, right? Where the patents are. If India doesn't let me file patents, I go to the Europe to file patent because I have my subsidiaries in Europe. I can go to US to file patents. I can go in any other countries. I don't depend on a country which doesn't allow me to file patents. So a patent reform change does not really affect them because they are adopting technology from before. They are multinationals. They are paying their managers more. They can go and file patents anywhere. The bottom one, below the median, they are so uh, behind in the race of technology adoption or innovation, a patent reform does not really trigger them to do anything more. Right. They are not gearing up for any change because anything they do, it's a really costly process, right, of doing technology adoption because you have to uh, institute an R&D department. Not every firm does R&D. It's the firms which are marginally big firms, which are from the sixth decile to the eighth decile, which are actually gearing up for the process. They are kind of in a race to file for patents and also this diagram we call it kind of a snail shaped it looks like a snail right so we call it a snail shaped effect uh, and this diagram actually gives you the idea that this effect is not driven by the correlation between technological it is driven 
price obviously technological the correlation between technological adoption and managerial compensation the higher you adopt technology the higher managers uh, you value for managers more you have to pay for managers more but if it's only been that case what would have happened then the higher the the bigger the firm is the higher would be managerial compensation so we'd have a direct positive straight line because the higher because it's a positive only positive correlation if the technological adoption think about technological adoption positively correlated with the managerial compensation and at every level if i am right uh, plotting this correlation managerial uh, technological adoption goes up managerial compensation goes up technological adoption goes up but that's not the case right it's flat then goes up and then goes down that gives them idea that we are in a kind of patent race what the firms are thinking the firms are thinking that 2005 india is going to be the wto ratifying all the laws so what should i do i have to be in a kind of a race i want to employ more managers so that that can give me more ideas to um produce new products new varieties so that i can go and f- as soon as 2005 happens i can file for patents so i'm in a race kind of a perfect competition once because once i file for the patents i have a monopoly on that product for 20 years right so but before having the monopoly i am in a competition with you because you you as a firm let's say you as a firm is also employing this managers i am as a firm also i try to employ because let's say we are competing in a close industrial group let's say toothpaste we want to um innovate a new toothpaste or something variation in the existing toothpaste and can file a patent for that once i file the patent i have a patent for 20 years but i have to be first in order to so i am in a rest in that so this gives an idea this graph that it's actually we this difference in the managerial or the value of the managers or the wage inequality is driven by race and any believe me any form of globalization or any form of change is unequal we there is no change or there is no process of globalization as of now we have seen that is not e- that is equal it's it's on the core the design of this policies on the core is actually unequal so that's why any ch- sort of change we see at the global level any sort of this kind of regulatory change we see it kinds of create an inequality but w- i'll just finish with this that one important result that we saw in this case was even if we divide the firms what we do we also look at by firms dividing into low tech industry and high tech industry want to see if the result is driven by the high tech industry let's say the uh, nuclear coke uh, petrochemical uh, pharmaceuticals these are highly r&d driven industries right and there are some low r&d driven industries as well you do not need r&d to do footwear uh you need some in food products you need some in some in chemics chemicals as well so these are low r&d driven industry so we what we with when we divide this into r&d and low r&d and high r&d driven industries we see exactly same kind of effect in both rn low r&d and high r&d which is kind of an encouraging that even the low r&d people are kind of taking though the effect is lower but they are also taking undertaking technology adoption and there is again the wage inequality also happens there because there are firms undertaking technology adoption differentially that's all i wanted to say uh thank you thank you for your time any questions any comments any clarifications are welcome should i unshare my slides or yes yes Yeah so you can do that. Um so so we have some questions that we sure. wanted to ask you before we dive into the questions that the audience has sent us. Sure. Um so when we were talking about wage inequality in India mm-hmm. because uh with the effect of the IPR laws that come into place um several countries like the US um have questioned the enforcement of IPR in India okay yes and it remains a major concern for the country specifically when it comes to attracting young 
thinkers and developers who will um enhance the innovation that is produced in india so where are we lagging when it comes to the enforcement of such laws so it let me take a step back now and so india was severely uh, criticized by the us and the eu firms especially in the 1990s when we were lot dependent on what we call reverse engineering so because product patents were not applicable in india what we used to do is kind of so process patent is a tricky than it's it's la- less stringent than product patents think about a product okay any toothpaste let's say think about a product now for a product patent you really have to create a new variety rather than a the, the existing one in the process patent what is you can produce the same thing you just tweak something in the process so that was kind of a reverse engineering so you, you india was taking india was taken several times to the wto court being severely criticized then and that also led to the part of the process that what we implemented the laws in 2005 but after 2005 it's still yes it's still been criticized i know it's the it's the patent process granting system i may not be the correct person to say this because you need patent lawyers to say that but it's the patent granting system which being argued is to be much more rigorous because until and unless you making the ideas secure people might be worried to come up with new ideas right and that where we might be lacking in the terms of the rigorousness of the process when you are granting a patent i can give you one uh, um, personal experience in this so i uh, worked for a couple of years after my masters in india and then kind of thought for go for higher study so during when i was working in delhi uh, and I, then i started uh, writing one paper Just because i kind of decided let's go for higher study so i started writing one paper based on a project i was doing for government of india actually so i used to work in an organization called teri and i was in a trade and development department and we had a project from the government of india about environmental laws regulations uh, and how that this affected different kinds of firms and all these environmental laws have been uh, instituted by the our export partners and i wrote that paper and uh, submitted a paper for a, a conference in the UN environment program in New York and i was lucky got selected and went there for the presentation i was talking with this uh, uh, members of the uh, the the US environmental agency and some people in the US environmental agency also came for presentation there um, and i was uh, asking them that you guys must have a lot of economists working in the us environmental agency um, you do you employ phd's because i was working in in environment trade so just ask well, why do we need economists the first question um no because you have to understand the economic implications no we need lawyers the we have the first preference of the lawyers because the laws needs to be stringent first then comes the role of the economists until the laws are being not implemented properly the economist doesn't play a role in this case so what we first need what we first look for is the smartest of the lawyers and in so laws are the one of the most stringent important or stringent things that actually may bind things together actually helps yes every law having said that i can say every law in this case as you have seen is kind of unequal it does not affect everyone equal it is impossible to affect everyone equally in its core it's unequal but still what we look for is an overall welfare implications as a as a student of economics what we look for is whether the consumers are gaining as well because the consumers if you think of the consumers are gaining in terms of high quality products right the prices might go down so we are gaining as terms of prices we are gaining getting high quality products so consumer welfare implications might go up so in a sense what we need to do is we need to sit down and basically see what are the dead weight loss and what are the consumer welfare are gain and then calculate the overall welfare implications inequal yes but we need to look up and the laws 
kind of always seen in the long run there is an inequal distribution in the short run but in the long run if you see stringent laws have actually made things much more uh, I, what should i say um, competitive and much more uh, innovative in this case um so so yes so when we were talking about um the fact that they have to be more innovative the the laws itself but mm -hmm. in if you look at it india has been trying to establish itself as an ipr friendly nation in the world um and it's trying to redefine its standards as per the global intellectual property okay. norms but data sets like if you look at the world bank data that comes out Mm -hmm. but it suggests that patent applications of non residents is still much higher in india compared to actual residents so it, we actually the number of patents that are issued to residents in india are actually less so why is it that why do resident why are more applications granted to non residents and also how does it actually affect the economy both um in a macro way and a, and on a micro economic standard so see this is this the question is interesting but this gives you a larger perspective and uh, this kind of points out to a different sort of question so yes you are absolutely correct that the non resident indians would have higher patent applications but if you take a step back and think that if you you think of the counterfactual and what do i mean by counterfactual so if you take those residents out where let's say i am filing a patent here from here for example in uk and if i if you put me there in india would i been able to file that patent or not i don't know really don't know because it gives you a bigger picture of the infrastructure development because you need infrastructure first for the innovation first the other thing you need is which i really believe is the environment of our innovation of creating ideas you need environment if it a lot of it is not a lot of it i may be exaggerating when i say a lot of it but a part of it when we do our work when we become competitive is also driven by the environment we are in because environment actually drives us to be competitive i if i see people innovating it might drive some change may not be i may be not be innovative but it may drive me some to do some new things but if i'm not seeing any change around my side it it's your own drive that would drive you to do this innovations that's your own will to drive you to the innovation so i would say it would be a little far fetched to say filing of the non residents could affect india macroeconomy macroeconomically or microeconomically it's not really the case because if it really would have been the case then we would have to compare this things on a different levels of term because then you have to you give the incentives to those people to come to india and do the innovation and that depends on a lot of different things which may not be only ipr laws which may not be only i depend on ipr laws depend on on many simultaneous things that is happening when you work let's say you work in environment i don't know the infrastructure you working or the incentives that you are getting so for this i haven't showed you this um in this work when we divide the firms by ownership by when we look at the firms by domestic ownership and foreign ownership the foreign that this in, in increase in the managerial value in the foreign firms are four times higher than the domestic firms four times higher so it's a huge amount of money that they you will getting four times you are getting more incentive let's say in order to create a new product and i haven't showed you when i i have the data for the dividing the compensation between the wages and the incentives so wages is called the fixed component and the in incentives is the variable component you all know right it depends on your performance which is called the pay for performance award and when i divide this this change in the compensation by wages and incentives is completely driven by incentives and not wages actually 
and this incentives is maximum it's mostly driven by it's in a greater fashion is driven by the foreign owned firms rather than the domestic owned firms because the incentives are higher because they have a better working environment i can innovate more so yes it's a question for sure but it's i'm not very sure how much only the ipr laws would depend on this it's a part of it for sure that my ideas may not be that protected if i go and uh, invent there but it's not only ipr laws it's a factor of many different things which is not it's kind of not driving the people to go out there and invent Um, so, just one last question before sure. we move on to the questions that the audience has. They're sure. really eager to um, ask you some questions. So, Absolutely. just one last. Um, so, um, India's black market um, mm. survives on the misuse of IPR flaws. It is a huge issue, but we are also we are also aware that the black market employs a lot of workers, especially from the middle or the lower classes, or what we can call the informal sector. Mm -hmm. so um how do we negate the problem of the black market but also take care of the people that are engaged in it especially given the current employment conditions so there are two parts in this question first is the laws are actually so this kind of laws do they actually affect the informal sector or do they actually affect the black market actually not i would say not the informal sector so if you see that if you think of the diagram of the snail shaped diagram think of the diagram what happened below the median it's flat so the firms the smaller firms actually doesn't care about innovation and being a big home market like this every firm in india or a sector of firms what do they do they basically look after their niche market and they kind of tend to cater to that niche market so i'm not very much sure that that the informal sector is actually get affected by the in any kind of innovation laws because this you know informal sector is not going out, it doesn't go out in the world to sell think about look at the bigger picture when we look at think about 100 units of output that india produces okay the 10% or the 15% of the of the entire sector which is which is kind of a drawback although the 10 to 15% of our manufacturing sector registered sector actually produces 90% of our output 85% of our manufacturing sector produces 10% of our output can man see the unequal difference here so this informal sector is is so is big in terms of labor employment which is a big question it's a completely a different question because 80 to 85 percent of the labor force is actually dependent on now it's 82 percent i guess is actually dependent on the informal sector and 18 percent of the labor force actually dependent on so 18 percent of the labor force is actually driving your 90 percent of the output we produce and 82 percent of the labor force actually driving 10 percent of the output so when you think of this kind of laws which you have to be global the informal sector pl role play is very small very very small now having said that there we we definitely need we definitely look for because the problem with having a large informal sector is you do not the ta as you said the black market we do not account for the tax because a lot of tax is getting because if you have 82% of your population the labor force is dependent on the informal sector that means 82% is not filing for taxes whatever gains you have in terms of your incentives or whatever it is you are not filing for taxes so that's a different question in this case that informal inclusion of informal sector to the formal sector it's it's a problem for developing country like us if you go to brazil if you go to argentina there are large informal sectors as well and they also having these problems of in inclusion of informal sector into formal sector i don't know what the mechanisms it could be to include there are many mechanisms to include formal into informal sector but ipr laws per se would not drive by my uh, 
um, understanding of the IPR laws doesn't drive much of the informal sector because because so think about any innovation when you think about innovation it's very difficult to establish an R and D facility right because you need a huge amount of fixed cost and even though let's say informal sector firms. Informal sector firms, by definition, sometimes, and it has been shown by research that they also don't want to grow. That's a problem as well because they are enjoying the tax benefits from the government, being at level at certain level, threshold level below the threshold level. Say so also by themselves they do not want to grow because they have to now account for this R and D facility because you have to give tax when you are doing this. So informal sector doesn't play much of a role in the IPR laws. Plus, plus it, that's a different uh, problem we have, but not really for the IPR laws to do. Because if you are even if you are doing some kind of innovation at the global level, that is not getting accounted for. That's I don't know. I've answered it uh, uh, correctly because I'm uh, or not, but. That's what I think the informal sector is is uh, is a problem, but uh, it's not really affected by the IPR laws. Thank you so much, sir. This has been Thank truly you. interesting to have a conversation with you. The audience is really, really eager to ask you some questions, so we'll just please, dive right please, into them. Um, so, the first question is: um, Patents in the pharmaceutical industry enable high drug costs. Mm -hmm. with quite a few drugs uh, that can prove to be highly beneficial if available at low costs mm -hmm. would it be apt to tweak the laws to sit with the ideals of a welfare state and if so what harm could tweaking the laws cause so there again two parts of the question first tweaking the laws again would harm the incentives to innovate always any when you are if you can if you can give full protection if you are not giving full protection to to the ideas that have been generated the person or the firm in this case who is generating or investing in you would might not get incentive to do such such because he is not getting the due for its innovation so tweaking laws never actually help you in the long run it might have some short run gains but if you think about long run gains in the consumer welfare consumer surplus producer surplus really doesn't gain much now about the idea of a welfare state welfare state is it, there are only handful number of countries in the world which is actually a welfare state uh, can you say me a num name that you can think of which is a welfare state it's it's not very common countries you can think of us is not the the first thing that comes to your mind would be us us is mm -hmm. absolutely not a welfare state everything there is market driven it. is market driven uh, especially the health system the, the yeah. main problem with the us is the health system the health okay. system is driven by big pharmaceutical companies uh so would you say that countries like germany or sweden or Sweden Norway, is the correct maybe. exactly exactly Norway they, yeah the Scandinavian countries the, the stand, the, yeah the Nordic countries the yeah. Nordic countries are actually a welfare state countries where everything is taken care of by the government uh, people your pension everything is taken care of by the government or everything whatever you can you just give ta high tax you give that the the idea of welfare state is actually the higher you skilled are the higher it will be taxed it's it's difficult to actually process because let's say if i go there and work i'll be very as a high tax person because i have high skill the idea of a welfare state is you take the tax revenues from the top skilled person and you kind of distribute in the bottom skilled person or the people who are unskilled so that's you decrease the inequality over time and these are the countries which are the most equal countries in the world almost but there has to be everything taken care by the government in india the part of our health system is still very we kind of now what what amount of health expenditure we invest we 
invest almost 1.8% of our GDP on health expenditure to do, which is absolutely not ideal. We at least need to spend 4 to 5%. In order to at least reach certain portion of the population, 85 to 86 percent of our health expenditure in India is out of pocket. So you can imagine the amount of health expenditure we yes. Then the problem here is it come it gives a problem because then if you tweak if you have a strengthening of the laws, then what happens? I can have I can really mark up the my price and can have higher amounts of revenue from the consumer. That's a problem. Because you have to spend by yourself here, let's say in, in the UK, it's also taken care by the government. If I go, f- let's say in the current scenario, if I go for the vaccine, I do not have to buy the my local health center will call me up when my number comes in, I go and take the vaccine. And that's about it. My nothing has to be done from this. They have all our details. So it it has to be driven by the government. But in some cases, if, even if you see for cases like this, what we do is, it's, again, this is kind of, you need patent lawyers in this case. That's why you need strong patent lawyers. Sometimes what you need is, let's say in case of the COVID vaccine, it's not being highly priced. So some cases you cannot really, in case of this emergency, I guess it's priced in India, it's about 1,000 rupees, right? If I, 1,000 rupees for the India version or the Oxford's AstraZeneca one, which is called the Covishield, is 2,000 rupees. So which is still affordable to a large section of the population. But it can happen in case like country like us, when you have out-of-pocket expenditure, stronger laws can actually lead, lead to decline in consumer welfare because you can really charge high prices. So then the role comes off the lawyers basically to you file cases against this kind of companies and you kind of drive the price down it's it's nothing to do against this again there are two sides of it there is a positive side where you can giving laws uh, stringent laws give you gives you the incentives to do innovation more but in sectors like pharmaceutical it's tricky in other manufacturing sectors, it's not that tricky, but in case of, because it's directly related to consumer welfare, the pharmaceutical sector, it's tricky. How do you kind of do a balance between strengthening of laws and also so that the strengthening of laws does not give a large markup to the pharmaceutical product prices or to the, which is essential to the life drugs. And so it's, it's really difficult to comment, but we, kind of need stronger, again, the stronger laws in the other sense, um, in a, let's say, socialistic structure country like us, we build on a socialistic structure. Um, it's the job more or less a lot by the lawyers, the social reformers, a lot of people who works on the social organizations, they go and uh, campaign against uh, when you mark up prices so they have to fight these PILs a lot of processes being goes on in order to drive the prices down but it, it's a it's a tricky thing to do yeah, I really don't know how to balance this what could be the ideal way to balance this but uh, uh, this is how it is um, so we have more questions I'll just pick sure. one um, could strong IPR laws actually cause unequitable division of income? In that case, how can developing countries prioritize one over the other? You cannot really prioritize. What you need to look at is, is how the laws are affecting our economy at the aggregate. When we think about the aggregate, we think about putting everything together. We think about consumer surplus. We think of producer surplus. We think of the loss we are getting. So when you are employing a law or repealing a law, what we think of an aggregate effect first, then the law takes its own course. It's inequitable for sure for a developing countries. All of the developing countries where the law has been 
initiated in terms of the IPR have unequal distribution of income. That's for sure. But you also have to think that even if you give equal distribution of resources, if you prioritize, let's say, the bottom firms over the top firms, what the problem is, then the problem is it will give some kind of misallocation of resources in the long run. Because if you are protecting the unproductive firms by some laws or the other, it's not going to produce productive output because by definition, they are unproductive firms. So if you are giving protection to the unproductive firms, what you are contributing at the other side, your other side, you're contributing to the misallocation of resources. That's what the problem is with us in terms of the informal sector as well. A lot of it is because of the misallocation, because you're protecting some, that, the example that I gave you, some firms also, let's say there is this threshold called five fifty million in Indian rupees of the capital and machinery expenditure. If you are below 50 million in terms of capital machinery expenditure, you are kind of a SME who get a lot of tax benefits from the government. That's why firms do not want to grow. And this is actually a, even if the firms cannot can invest, they can they could they will not. And that's actually a misallocation of resources. Because you are giving tax benefits to those firms, which actually could have grown over time and can help in other things to employ more, to do pr more productive things. So prioritizing also gives a misallocation problem. Um, and you have to be really careful how we are prioritizing uh, b b things. I have a paper, uh, which I actually was there last year in, in this time in RBI. And it because of an RBI law, what happened during the crisis? So our Indian banking system has a law in 1969, it was taken in 1969, that during the time of the crisis, the government will look after the state-owned banks more than the private banks. Okay, In 1969, when the banks were nationalized, it, the law was taken. 2008-9, when actually we are in crisis, financial crisis, what happened? The, the public sector banks are given more loans than the private sector banks. And uh, I, what I look at, I looked at the firms which are connected to the public sector banks as opposed to the firms which are connected to the private sector banks. And I found that the, the firms which are connected to the public sector banks were not that affected during the crisis as opposed to the firms which are connected to the private sector banks because they got the loans during the crisis. And when I look at this, and when I look at the misallocation problem, what, what I found is that these firms which actually got the loans, more loans from the uh, RBI, were actually unproductive much about 10% less productive than the firms which are connected to the private. So what does this message give you? You are actually protecting with the firms which are unworthy of protecting. So if you prioritize, that gives a misallocation problem. So it's policy. When you are taking policy, you have to be really careful that what is the overall effect when you are looking at the misallocation, we are looking at the consumer surplus, we are looking at the producer surplus, putting this all together, that gives an effect. Yes, again, it's, it's, it's an unequal effect as I showed you and many results will show you in the long run, you will see it's unequal effect for sure. But also think about if is it would, wouldn't have been more unequal if would have given the resources to the unproductive firms would have been or not i don't really know this case would have would have they performed really well they might have not performed they might not uh, uh, innovate new things because they do not have the capacity to innovate that could be it as well right so uh, it's it's tricky prioritizing also always doesn't help much to us Um, so I would love to have a longer conversation with you on this topic because it is genuinely really interesting. But unfortunately, we're running out of time. Oh. Um, so I just want to say a huge thank you to you for giving us your valuable time. And no worries. My pleasure interacting with I, you all. And sharing your valuable thoughts and your knowledge and expertise in this subject. It meant a lot to all of us. And to our lovely audience who sent in so many questions, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I would like to call our president, Ms. Anunita Jena, to formally conclude this session. 
on the behalf of the entire team i would like to extend my gratitude to pavel sir for taking time out from his busy schedule and holding such an insightful session we certainly got to learn a lot of new and innovative concepts so thank you so much for that sir i would also like to thank everyone who joined us today without whose support this wouldn't have been possible we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 11 am for a session on inequality in the informal sector thank you so much that's an interesting topic thank you thank you sir thank you bye all keep well and be safe